to go? Yep. Audio is moving? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I'm sure you want to talk about the test and I was going to do that a few minutes. How did it go? Did you think uh, it was that difficult? Was in line with the homework, that is the idea, uncollected homework, homework test. So I, I, I'm really trying to have people get into the point of doing a test without thinking, oh, this is something I don't even uh, know at all. So, um, so these are the answers, and I, and I uploaded a MATLAB file. It doesn't mean that you needed MATLAB. I just did it in MATLAB because it was easier for me to do the computations. Uh, but really, everything that was required was, at the most, doing some uh, cross products and computing norms of vectors, which you should be able to do. Um, so the most common thing that has happened, I don't think it's the majority of you, but many of you, with these numbers I gave you, um, got a, uh, for the first question, an eccentricity of something 10 to the minus 5. And of course, that's not exactly zero, right? So it's not incorrect to say it's elliptical, but I'll show you numbers how elliptical that really is. And um, at this point in your academic career, you, sh you're, you know, you're going to be engineers. You need to be able to round up numbers. So you know, you're never going to get exactly zero in your life when you sum things up, especially experimentally, you know, exact numbers. So what I did in writing that number there, 6.3133 kilometers per second, is the following. I took the, uh, what is it, up here. So this would be, can you see it okay on uh, the camera, Patrick? Yeah, it's fine. If this is the initial velocity and I compute it with the expression for a circular orbit, you, don't, you do get that number plus a bunch of digits. And uh, we're going to look at that. So this is my V0, right? And of course, it's not 6.3133. But if I stop there, that's, that's what you get. And uh, since these are kilometers per second, so this 1, 2, 3, I stopped right here. So I started ignoring centimeters per second. So you don't have centimeters in my uh, velocity expression, the value I gave you, right? I stopped there. Once again, with engineers, centimeters per second versus seven, six kilometers per second, to me, it's negligible. But just to convince you about that, I should have it saved right here. So this is, in percentage, how much uh, compared to the velocity that I gave you, I am removing from the actual circular velocity. Seven, ten to the minus four percent. Would you consider that something that you care about? No. So 6.3133, it's a reasonable enough approximation for the circular velocity. This is another check that you could have done, just computing the square root of mu over r to, to confirm, yeah, that's, you know, that's the uh, truncation or uh, rounding the actual circular velocity. And in fact, if you go with the uh, number I gave you, you do get an e that is not exactly 0. I agree with you. Uh, e norm, it's not computed yet. Um, Yeah, that, you, 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 uh, you, oh yeah, uh, why am, is it telling me zero? Because I don't have the format long maybe on? Let me see. Is it the exact? I'm running the exact, that's why. Yeah, 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 good point. Uncomment this one, no. Uncomment this one, yes. And so I want to show you also another couple of numbers just to give an idea of, you know, how much we are really approximating. So I was going to show you E norm. Yeah, it's 1, 10 to the minus 5. It's not incorrect to call this elliptical, OK? I told Patrick and, and Thomas we're going to go through the tests to look at the procedures, not just say, no, this guy is saying elliptical, remove 10 points, OK? They're going to look at the procedure. But the problem is that it propagates uh, the fact that you don't feel comfortable saying that this is uh, uh, circular. It propagates to the next question, which is, what if my velocity is square root of 2 v0, which is exactly the velocity you would need to be on escape, which means parabola. You get an eccentricity of 0 0.998. I don't know if there is an additional 9. Can you call that 1? Yes, you can. Because if you plot the trajectory that you get with that eccentricity, and you try to fit in your plot that ellipse that has an eccentricity of 0 0.998, 
it will never come back. You can make your plot as big as you want. It's not coming back. You can try. So it's, you know, it's being reasonable with the numbers, but again, uh, we're, we're going to try not to penalize people who didn't think about, you know, yeah, calling this zero, which is really, I could have given you just the square root of mu over r, but that would have been even, you know, easier than it was. Uh, another comparison that you can do is the following, r apogee minus r perigee, these are kilometers. So it's about, uh, yeah, there is a difference, 300 meters, a little less. Is this negligible? I can probably run, I don't know, 300 meters in, let's say, 30 seconds. Yeah, that would be too much. Yeah, too fast. A minute, okay? I can walk them in, in a minute. This orbit has a radius of 10,000 kilometers. Does it make a difference? Yeah. Depends what you want to do. If you want to rendezvous with that, then 200 meters make a difference. You need to reach that point. But quite frankly, uh, it's, it's a circle. So. Again, we're not going to penalize people just be, to be mean, uh, but I think the majority of you realized that this was a circle, and the next one was a parabola, and the next one was a uh, hyperbola. And that was really the point of giving you uh, this square root of 2, v0, 2, v0, okay? Uh, the period is whatever you get. Have I computed it? Yes. It's, uh, well, you know it. You probably ran this program. 9,000, uh, almost 10,000 seconds. Then, um, okay, the other two questions here, uh, if, if you have solved the point three and you said that that is a parabola, then we have seen without demonstration that at any point on a parabolic flight, you get the flight path angle, which is exactly half of the uh, true anomaly. So there was a sequence here that you, you need to realize this was parabolic, then here, divide by two, done, 20 degrees. And then, if this is an hyperbola for you, what is the maximum true anomaly you get on an hyperbolic path? You go to infinity at an angle which we call theta infinity, right? And so that's, that's what you need to compute. And uh, probably should run this thing uh, till the end because I don't know what that is. Oh, by the way, thanks to the gentleman who uploaded the code to make the planet look like a planet. I copied that from one of you. It's very nice. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, theta infinity should be here, yeah, 109.47 degrees, that's in degrees, and that is your question uh, six, I think, six, five, six, yeah. And then we move to this one. So these also were supposed to be relatively quick if you knew what was going on. Uh, in a parabolic flight, the energy is zero, and I don't know if Patrick can see that, maybe I'll turn on the light and it's v squared over 2 minus mu over r, and this is your kinetic energy, k, if you want to call it that way, and this is your potential energy, p, and so I'm asking uh, if they are the same at all points, yes, because you bring one on the other side, and they, they need to be the same because the, the addition is zero, yes? Uh, when I read the question, I understood uh, constant, is equal? It's also true, the energy is also constant, it's zero all the time. The the, of it, oh, no, no. So I, I think there may be misspelling a typo here. I should have probably said the magnitudes. I was thinking about that. I think most of you got it right. Um, so this piece is always equal to this piece in my, so if you remove the signs, if you don't care about the signs, uh, this is obviously always positive and, and, and this is negative. So this, this is true, right? This is true. This is what I was asking. So that's true. Then transport theorem, okay, about transport theorem, I didn't expect anyone to demonstrate anything because that's dynamics, uh, and if you go back to your dynamics class, if you've taken it here, uh, for example, transport theorem is demonstrated when you do kinematics, you don't even talk about inertial reference frames yet at that stage, and you don't assume anything about the two reference frames that are involved. So they're both false. It is not true that one of the two has to be inertial. It is not true that one of the two has to rotate only. They can do whatever they want. A and B are whatever reference frames you can think about. That's how the transport theorem is derivated. There is no assumptions. It's a different story that I've used the transport theorem multiple times to show how the velocities of a point um, is, are seen from different observers where the two observers rotate and translate with respect to each other. But those are relationships between velocities and accelerations, right? 
those are special cases that I, you know, I found that, that expression with the uh, centripetal, if you want to call it that way, acceleration, Coriolis acceleration, etc. That is not that is an application of the transport theorem. You start from rate of change of a vector in A is equal to the rate of change in B plus omega B with respect to A cross with the vector itself. That is valid for any A and B. Do we agree on that? Again, this is yes. Inertial reference frame is an absolutely stationary set of at least three non-collinear points, uh, which we introduce as a concept to justify Newton's laws. So think about the universe, there is somewhere a frame where things don't move at all. And then everything that translates with respect to that is also an inertial reference frame. I thought we, I thought we just like said we call the Earth inertial You can call anything you want inertial as long as it's a good approximation for whatever it is that you're measuring. Uh, to be inertial. The Earth accelerates because it goes around the Sun and it spins about its axis, but uh, if I were to run an experiment on this table, short duration experiment, start short distances, F equal ma would probably work in here. So I can call this room inertial, even though it's not. So, but again, the, what, what the, the, the questions were simply, do you need to start from these assumptions to derivate the transport theorem? No. Go back to kinematics. In kinematics, you talk about reference frames. You don't even introduce the concept of inertial reference frame. Any reference frame is fine. And any motion is fine. There is no assumptions whatsoever. And then, last one uh, is instead, uh, it's still looking at the uh, energy if you want. On a hyperbolic orbit, we have the excess speed, right? So you go on the asymptote at infinity, but you do have a residual velocity. Now, what is relative? Many people ask me, what is relative? Remember that we started talking about gravitational forces, saying there is a mass m1 and a mass m2. They move with respect to an inertial, inertial observer. And then at some point, we said, forget about this. I can sit myself in a coordinate system, in a reference frame fixed with the first mass, choose three axes that don't change orientation. The origin is mass m1, the Earth, from now on, probably. And the little r and little r dot are the relative position and relative velocity of a satellite with respect to the planet. We never have to forget that the planet is also moving with respect to the sun, and the sun is moving with respect to something else. But that is what relative means. It's, it's, you know, it's the R and V, everything that we've dealt with so far. So on a hyperbolic path, you go to infinity, but you actually go away. Uh, you have a residual velocity uh, at infinity, yes? What do you mean by residual That there is not zero. That's not zero. Fair. So on the parabolic path, we call that an escape trajectory, right? Uh, because you go, uh, your true anomaly goes to 180 on a parabola, right? Um, and, uh, and you go, in theory, you go to infinity, but then you stop. You basically match, at the end, you're going to match the velocity of the Earth. Because if you don't have any residual velocity relative to the Earth, you're moving like the Earth. Does that make sense? If you don't have any relative velocity with respect to an object, you're moving as that object. So that's what happens on a parabola. Instead, if you want to go and leave the planet forever and go on some other path, then you have to be on a hyperbolic orbit. But we haven't talked about interplanetary emissions yet. So, but basically, the bottom line was um, that here you do have that v infinity that is not zero. Uh, depends on your eccentricity. But that's you know the idea was to go quickly on the concepts we have seen with relatively minimal calculations. You have to do an h and an e calculation. So those are two uh, cross products. You have to compute norms. Again, if you had responded here that this is circular, this, you could have just told me, parabolic. Because if that is circular and you put a square root in front of it, that's the velocity on a parabola. And if you go above the square root of 2, then you know on a hyperbolic path. I would have taken that as a, an answer. And, and then, yeah. Two questions for number one. If I did the h equals r cross v, if I did everything, and I erased it all and just did square root mu over r, it was circular, mm -hmm. will I get full credit for doing that? Well, I have to be fair. There are people who did approximate right, uh, which is what I would expect from an engineer. So probably not full, but close. Okay. I'll have, we'll have to think about it. I, I want to see. So what I told the TAs that were grading this is, um, you know, what we do with curving is also we, we see at uh, the average how the class did. If 99 people do it right and one doesn't, 
it doesn't mean that I'm going to remove the entire credit, but I have to be fair because most of the people got it right. So this was not really confusing. So it depends. I want to see how many got it right and how many did, you know, did not assume that that was zero. Which again, in principle, is not incorrect. But as an engineer, if you work in a NASA and they give you these numbers and you say that it's elliptical, I, I mean, they probably live with that. Uh, but for the first one, because you know, between, between a circle and an ellipse where the same image or axis, the uh, apogee and perigee are only 200 kilometers of, the, of meters of difference, it's, you know, it's still a closed orbit. The problem is when you move from that to something that has an eccentricity of 0.99999 and you call it an ellipse, which means you expect it to come back, you're going to wait for a long time. That is really, it's practical. It's, it's just uh, how practical you are. You want to call that one, I think you should call that one. But again, it's not, it's not, I'm not saying it's incorrect. But not saying that this is circular, then probably made all these other steps more complicated for you. Because if you assume that this is circular, then you may remember that that's exactly the velocity on a parabola. Done. This is a parabola. You don't even need to compute anything. And then twice that velocity is definitely above square root of 2, so it's definitely an hyperbolic path. Done. You don't have to do any calculation. Now, I'm referring to point 3. That was a parabola, so I divide this by 2. I don't need anything else other than that. And this, yeah, this requires a calculation. It's an arc cosine then of minus 1 over e, because you know you're on a hyperbolic orbit. So in my mind, these were sequ sequential questions where you know, if you don't assume the first one is circular, you can still do the rest, but you probably are going to do, are going to do it the hard way with the full-blown calculations. That's, that's what I mean. So probably those who have assumed that this is elliptical, uh, what they've done here, they have recomputed the h, recomputed the e, recomputed the eccentricity, and said, oh, it's still elliptical. While if that's circular, and that's the velocity I give you, you open the book on the, uh, on, the, on the page on the book that says square root of 2 b circular is the, parabol is the velocity of escape. And you're done. I would accept that. So I'm just saying that if you didn't do the approximation there, you just made your life harder with calculations. So that's, uh, you know, and you want to avoid that if you can. So any other questions on this? Yes? Um, is it common for to have a lot of true or false questions on the test? I don't know. <laughs> I just felt like having those questions when I was preparing this. I don't know what I will do next time. But definitely you should expect the same kind of sequence, which means I'm giving you a homework so that you know what to expect. You train for that. And these should not be surprises. Now, if I test you on the theory, yeah, I mean, I can have another true or false. In my mind, these were pretty easy. 40% just knowing dynamics. Well, this is this too. So 20%, if you know dynamics, it's, it's, it's done. Well, these two, you need to know astrodynamics. Yeah. So I don't know. I think they help. They're a little dangerous, though. If you don't get it right, it's 10 points. But you know, at some point, we have to draw the line. So um, that, that is what I think uh, you will see for next times. Now, I do have some comments about the test. Comment number one, which cannot be a promise yet, because I haven't received confirmation. I may, we may have found a room which is three times bigger than this and has real desks. I, believe me, this was not the room they gave us in December. It was somewhere else, much bigger than this. And then I got an email, and you probably got my email as well, then we were switched to this room. Which is great because I can carry that pretty easily from my office and record the lectures, but I agree that this is not the best. Uh, but I did try at the beginning and this is what we were given. Now I asked. Um, Monday afternoon, after a few of you came and said, can we go somewhere else? I asked, and it seems like they found a place in the new physics building. It can host 300 people. So you can sit and actually have you know, space around you, empty, and there are real desks. I don't want to promise because I haven't received the email yet from uh, the lady, but that's probably what we're going to do. And the other thing is, the other email I sent you, so I apologize with those that have been a little harsh at the end when I was collecting the tests. Um, that is not the way to do it. That chaos that, that was created is not, I should have thought about this a little more. Uh, because I am here with the box, and it's 51, and I don't want to see anyone writing. It's not because I am against the students, I am in favor of students, I want to help you, but I don't think it's fair if everybody is standing up and turning in that is one still writing down at 51 or 52. I don't think that's fair, I can't have that. Uh, and you know, I've been a student myself. That's, that, that chaos allows people to talk to each other, I, I don't want to see that. So what we'll do next time, especially if we have a much bigger room, um, 
you know, if you turn in before 45, you can leave. If not, you wait until I say pencils down and everyone puts them down and we just go around and collect them. You won't be more than 100 because you are 100. It's three of us. We can do that in a couple of minutes and I think it's more organized for everybody, okay? So I'm sorry if I, you know, yelled at a couple of people. Someone was sitting down there and I said, you need to come down now. But uh, again, it's, it's hard to manage uh, people moving all over the place and uh, we shouldn't do that. So those are my only comments. Um, I think overall, I'm, I, I would expect a pretty high average. The homework, I think he, the average was 90. But that's the take home homework. So I'll be surprised if this is less, but we'll see. I've seen some tests and they're pretty good. The first one that was put in the box, I don't remember what it was, that person had everything right, pretty much. So I, and I've seen that around a lot, so I wouldn't be too concerned. But um, let me restate this once and for all. If you don't pay attention to the lectures, if you don't do the hand-collected homework, if you don't do the homework by yourself, if you just don't pay attention, then this is a surprise. It's going to be always a surprise. If you wait until the last minute, there's no, there's no fix for that. Okay? Any other questions? We're pretty good on the schedule, so you, we can take, I don't want to say today to talk about the test, but we can uh, use some time if you have other concerns. I really hope we get that room, not for lectures, but at least for the two upcoming tests. Okay. Good. Uh, anything else I need to show you in MATLAB? I don't think so. So, um, I was looking at your textbook, and uh, in the syllabus I did have universal variables, uh, which is quite a bit of math, and I decided not to do that, because it's a, a formulation that allows you to basically put together um, the uh, Kepler's equation for a uh, elliptical orbit and hyperbolic orbit using complex numbers. So I just decided, you know, this is a lot of math for now. If you have time, we'll go back to this. But I want to move on with, you know, concepts that are really important. Because in the end, you do know now what those Kepler's equations are and how to solve them numerically uh, or with the approximation that we discussed. So uh, I decided to move on to chapter four and then we can always go back and go more in depth uh, on some topics. And um, I really want to spend more time towards the end talking about more advanced material, for example, uh, spacecraft relative motion, uh, relative orbits, how we do rendezvous between two spacecraft. Those are very um, application-driven uh, lectures, and I, I want to do those those things rather than you know be heavy on the math on some things that we have already covered, anyways. Okay, so chapter four talks about orbits in 3D. So so far we talked about h, and that's really the only thing that goes outside of the plane. Uh, and after we define that h is constant and, uh, and that e is constant and this, those two are perpendicular to each other, we just basically said, okay, we're going to do everything in a plane, which is the plane of the orbit. And we really defined everything that we can define uh, for the geometry of those conics. Uh, but, but it's not really that helpful when you need to design a mission or, you know, talk about ground tracks, uh, you know, talk about your satellites doing some, taking some measurements around this planet, for example. And so another thing that we haven't done is formally defining ECI. I kept saying Earth-centered inertial reference frame. I put the origin of the coordinate system at the planet. I point the axis in three directions that never change. We never said what those directions are. Anything would work, but there is actually something that we use um, worldwide that we need to define. So it's time to talk about our planet and how it moves around the sun and what are, what are those directions that we use uh, for ECI. So um, geocentric coordinate systems is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and mostly looking at some of the images that we have in the book. If we have time, we'll start introducing orbital parameters, maybe, um, and the state vector. So this is a view of what we call the ecliptic plane. You know, the plane where the Earth is, is moving around the sun. And uh, so we're looking at this from above, from 90 degrees on that plane. And uh, we know that our planet spins about the south-north axis, right? It goes from west to east. Make sense? West is sunset, California. East is here. 
is sunrise. So this is the direction of rotation, and, and, and the Earth is basically spinning on its axis in the same direction counterclockwise for us. Okay? And those little, uh, this would be the axis of rotation. So if we're looking at this from above, 90 degrees, we would only see a point, right? But we have the tilt of the uh, spin axis, which is, do we know what that is? 23.4 or something like that, 23 depends, it changes, but it's around 23 degrees. And so that tilt uh, puts the spin axis away from being normal to the ecliptic plane, and, uh, and it does remain pretty constant for a long time, even though it does change, as we'll discuss in a, in a, in a minute. And so um, if there is a tilt of the spin axis, then the equatorial plane of our, on our planet is not corresponding to the ecliptic, ecliptic plane, right? Do we see that? If that axis was at 90 degrees, then the equatorial plane, which is normal to the spin axis, corresponds to the ecliptic plane, but that's not the case. They are, there is a tilt there, too. And so they always intersect at a line. And so as the, as the Earth goes around in a year, that line moves, right, up and down. And there is one particular uh, location for that line, which is called the vernal equinox, uh, which is the first day of spring for us, which is used as one of the axes for ECI, as we will see. So that is the day for us where spring starts, and you know the number of hours of sun and night is the same. And here, the Earth sees this. You see the sun basically coming from south, going to north, through the equator. If you are at the equator, so imagine that this this ball here is going around, and it's also spinning on its axis again, counterclockwise. So you need to start thinking about things moving in 3D and things spinning in 3D. Um, now, why is this uh, vernal equinox line important? Well, as I said in a minute, I will see that it's actually used in, in, as one of the axes for ECI. Um, oh well, because, uh, because it's a reference. It's an easy reference for us. And a long time ago, actually about 4,000 years ago, people decided to use this as a reference. And that's actually that symbol that we use um, it's, it, it's supposed to indicate the constellation of, I don't know how you pronounce that in English, Aries, A-R-I-E-S. It's Aries for me because this is Latin, so whatever you want to pronounce this, Aries, which is the ram, right? The ram constellation. So that symbol is from Babylonian symbols, uh, and 4,000 years ago that meant the head of the ram or something like that. Now, that line, that ver vernal equinox line, um, is not pointing at that constellation anymore. Nowadays, it points at the uh, Pisces, I think that's the right pronunciation in English. It's another Latin word, which means fishes. I don't know if Patrick can film this, probably not. You can try. I can turn on the light for a sec. So, this is 4,000 years ago, that line connecting spring, the first day of spring and first day of autumn for us, for the northern hemisphere, was actually pointing at a different constellation. And these days it's pointing at Pisces, that's how I would read it myself, but it's Pisces probably, the Fishes constellation, it's one of the constellations we have. Because that line is actually changing very slowly with time, but it's changing. And uh, as I said, that that would be an axis for ECI, we need to be aware that that is changing and why that it's happening. So, We'll go back to uh, the book here. Do you have any questions? Do you know all this stuff? Probably. So that axis, the spin axis of our planet, this is our planet now, the sun is that way, uh, it does actually move slowly with time. It goes around the cone. So if you imagine the ecliptic plane, the normal to the ecliptic plane, the spin axis is about 23 degrees, is not pointing in space always in the same direction, it slowly, it slowly, slowly goes around, uh, it precedes, there is a precession motion around that normal. Uh, you can imagine for now that it remains, the cone is always at 23.4 degrees and the spin axis goes around. It takes 26,000 years to go around. It's a long time. So that's why we assume that it stays constant because yeah, it's, it's several generations before you know one of our nephews can see that changing. So, um, but why is it changing? Because our planet, which so far we have assumed is a sphere 
of uniform mass distribution, it's not a sphere. I think we have discussed when I gave you the function J2 uh, about the fact that there is oblateness at the poles. In other words, you can take a ball, squeeze it on two sides, and you get some kind of ellipsoid. So you have uh, bulging at the, uh, at the equator, and that's exactly what we have. There is much more than that, uh, but that is one of the things that we know. Uh, there is more mass at the equator, and so what happens right there is that um, the sun is attracting our planet, but that force, F1, is a little more than F2. Now you may say the, the, the sun is very far away, yes, but you know, this, this, we're talking about six, 7,000 kilometers, so those, those two bulges are pretty far away from each other, and it does, it does make a difference. So what do you get on the planet if you have two forces like that, and we're assuming that we concentrate them at some points along the equatorial plane, what do you get? Even though it's very small, probably, you get a torque. You get a moment, right? And if F1 is more than F2, you get a moment that is going into the page, right? Now, we have defined angular momentum for a particle. We have not defined the angular momentum for a rigid body, if we assume that that's a rigid body. And I'm not going to do anything formal now, um, maybe for the rest of the class unless I need it. But you should remember this from your dynamics classes, that the angular momentum for a rigid body Computed, for example, with respect to the center of mass, so this bar on top means with respect to the center of mass, seen by an inertial observer, can be expressed as what? As the tensor of inertia of the rigid body itself computed with respect to the center of mass applied to the angular velocity of this rigid body, which in our case is the Earth, uh, with respect to the inertial observer. Do you remember what the tensor of inertia is? You must have seen this before. If you've taken dynamics with me, probably not with me, with Dr. Rao, with anyone in this department, and even outside of here, you should know what that is. And I'm going to tell you very quickly, this is a linear, it's not the matrix of inertia, okay? That is a projection of the tensor of inertia on a basis. It's a linear operator that takes a vector, in this case the angular velocity, operates on that vector and creates another vector. So basically, you can imagine this as something that takes a vector A, does something to it, manipulates it in a linear way, and it spits out another vector. In this case, it's spitting out, operating on the angular velocity of the Earth with respect to the inertial observer, the angular momentum. And we also know that the rate of change of this guy here, of H bar N in N, is also equal to the moment of all forces acting on the rigid body with respect to the center of mass. So, if I treat that uh, ellipsoid, our planet, as a rigid body, and if you have symmetries in your rigid body, the angular momentum, I'm not going to demonstrate any of this. This should be memories that you, you, you have. You can get a dynamics book. The angular momentum and the angular velocity happen to be parallel. That is not always the case. But for an approximation of our planet where everything is symmetric, if that's the angular velocity vector, that is also with some rescaling of force, that's the h vector too, right? So the angular momentum is, is, like this, is pointing along the spin axis. So what is happening here, I am introducing that torque, m, which is going into the page. So which way is that torque changing h? You know, as an abuse, I could say I can replace the derivative with deltas, right? Right? For a short interval of time, I can probably do this. So you can bring this delta t here if you want. But in other words, what I want to say is that the variation of the angular momentum due to this moment is in the same direction of the moment, right? Times a delta t, which is a scalar. Positive, of course. We never deal with time going backwards, usually. So in other words, if I'm applying a torque to this planet, the spin axis is pushed to move away from where it is and go into the page. And then you repeat that kind of logic in your mind, and it goes into the page again, into the page, so it goes around. It does this. In this case, it goes westward. So the precession of the spin axis is westward, and it takes 26,000 years. And so if that spin axis is changing, and I go back to the image I showed you before, also this line, 
uh, that is the intersection between the equatorial plane and the ecliptic plane is not going to be the same all the time. So 4,000 years ago, this was somewhere else. Okay? So for long durations of time, this spin axis, we can assume it's always pointing in the same direction in space. But it, it is slowly moving in reality. There is also another motion which is called nutation, because we also have the moon that is pretty heavy and that goes around us and has a similar effect as the sun on the bulges at the equator and that adds another period of oscillation of the spin axis. So the cone is still there, but there are smaller oscillations called nutation, uh, which has a period of about 18 years. Uh, mm -hmm. The variation is 0 0.0025 degrees, but it's there. So this spin axis is not fixed. We need to know that. Why? Because in reality, this vernal equinox line, we use it right now as one of the axes for ECI. Yes? Um, so, if the Earth is, you're saying like the tilt is changing, or is the, the rotation? The, the spin, so imagine, the, imagine this ball that is spinning, right? And imagine the spin axis. The spin axis is slowly changing in space. So you, the Earth is still spinning about that axis, but where that spin axis is pointing is changing. Gotcha. That's called precession. Right? Um, and then, so this, this, this particular line that we're using right now, for example, as the x axis, we'll define this today if we have time. But that vernal equinox line is the x axis of the ECI. Um, the one that we use today was the position of that spring autumn uh, line in year 2000. That's what we use today. And by the way, your book uses a lot of these as every book. So we use today the position of the, uh, of the of the vernal equinox at year 2000. We know this what this means, right? Anno Domini, okay, right, just checking. I've heard people saying that that's after that, which is true, but that's not what it means. So, um, so that's actually updated every, I think, 50 years. So we're going to use whatever is, was the direction of the vernal equinox in year 2000 until year 2025. Then we'll project where that line will be in year 2050, and we'll use it until 2075, and so on and so forth. So that is updated. People who work in space flight mechanics, when I was in Spain, for example, and I was working on computing positions of satellites at some point, they kept referring to this J2000 coordinate system, Julian 2000, whatever. The 2000 was there. Because if you don't tell me what is the coordinate system that you're using to, to make your measurements, it's pointless to give me a measurement, right? So we need to know that this is what is really happening. That, yeah, we use the ECI, which is, you know, this coordinate system that has the center at the center of our planet. And now the x direction, finally, we can say that it's pointing at as the vernal equinox direction. Uh, but we need to know that this gets updated, actually. And, uh, well, since we're here, we can probably define the rest. Um, if this is the north-south direction, and this is the equatorial plane, the, uh, well, the z of the ECI is, is in the north direction, so this is north. And then, you know, you have the y direction that completes a right-handed frame, a right-handed coordinate system. And that is the coordinate system that is called the ECI. So you imagine this going with the planet. Again, it doesn't spin with the planet. This planet is doing its thing. It's spinning. But imagine that, that uh, vernal equinox line, we just carry it around, and we use that as one of the axes of the ECI. The spin axis is, this is the z, and the y axis is whatever completes the right-handed coordinate system. Yes? Uh, the xy plane there is? Equatorial. Equatorial. With, the pl with the planet, yes, yes. So that is what I meant by ECI all this time that I talked about orbits. That is basically what people, uh, when, when you run your MATLAB file and you plot those trajectories in x, y, z, those are the x, y, z. So you need to keep in mind that if you do it up until year 2025, that is your x, y, z. And then someone will tell you switch to something else. It's just telling you where the x direction is actually pointing from the sun's perspective, right? Because, you know, from an observer which is outside of the planet, that is changing. Yes? So x, y are in the equatorial plane? Equatorial plane, yes. So z is not in line with the axis? I'm sorry? Z is not in line with, like, the axis of position? It should be, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not in line with the, 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 the,
So okay. if this page, this page, imagine as this page is the uh, is the plane where the uh, orbit of the Earth is 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 lying. So that this circle is on this page. But then, what is going around that circle is an actual sphere, kind of a sphere, um, and and the equ equator is not in this plane. It's a little bit tilted like this. Yeah. yeah so it's going like this. And we have the, the x-axis going like that. The z-axis will be at 23 degrees, yeah. 0.4. No, no, no. It's like the spin axis. And uh, this comes from also very old ways of measuring things. Uh, the celestial sphere is what uh, we still use to tell where things are um, around this planet. So this just gives me an excuse to move to another image here that will lead us to the definition of, of orbital parameters. So this is what we still do to locate stars in the night sky, for example. Um, we say, OK, uh, we imagine there is a sphere around this planet, or whatever radius you can think of. Uh, and this is the direction of the vernal equinox. And uh, a point will be a star, something away, will be projected on this sphere, and it will have a right ascension, which is basically the degree, the uh, longitude on this grid that I build on the sphere, and then a declination, which is the latitude on that sphere. So you may have a star at 45 degrees, and this is east, and 20 degrees north. That's how we locate things in the sky. And if they are far away and there are stars, they don't usually change that much for a short period of time, short several years. Uh, but if you have a satellite, well, you can imagine that changes pretty fast. <coughs> International Space Station goes around the planet every 90 minutes, so those, those are changing. Okay? Um, so this, this definition of the ECI comes from, from what people were doing 4,000 years ago. Again, this line has this symbol, gamma, whatever you want to call it, because of people taking measurements 4,000 years ago, which is, to me, it's pretty amazing. And, and just to give you an idea of how these things change, um, there is a couple of tables here that are very interesting. So if you look at, for example, Venus and the moon, these two things move in our night sky, right? They don't stay still. They move. So these would be the right ascension, those two angles I told you, which is also measured in, in, in uh, hours, basically 360 is 24 hours. Uh, and, and this is always measured in degrees. So these are where they are depending on the month during um, year 2004 in this example. So you see, they change, of course, because they are moving objects. And uh, another way to call, this is all terminology, to call the position of an object in sky in astrodynamics is ephemeris, so that you can take it as position. But if you go now to something farther away, like this star here, they have an example. Um, these are measurements from 1700s to 2000. You see, it's changing. This is a star which is far away. And why is that changing? If you don't update the, uh, uh, precession, the, the equinox line, that's, that is making your, your object change, because the line of the equinox is actually changing. So bottom line of all this, which is probably getting a little confusing and it shouldn't, is that, once again, the ECI is defined that way, but from now on, you need to tell me, you need to tell the user, if you, if you deliver a piece of software that simulates an orbit, whatever it is, you need to tell the user that your simulation is valid using a coordinate system that has the vernal equinox, equinox at a specific epoch. Like in this table, they're telling you the precession epoch is 2000 AD. Someone can do the same uh, with the precession epoch, I don't know, 1950 AD. You can, they can do that, it's not illegal. If they know, you know how that line has been moving in the last 50 years, they can backtrack it and, and, and use that as the ECI. And that's a perfectly fine one. But again, it's, now it's a specific coordinate system. And so once, once you have a specific coordinate system, like in this case, where things do evolve slowly, you need to tell which is the date that, you, that you're using. OK. So now, the, uh, the last thing I want to say, I don't think I want to start. Um, really on orbital elements, but maybe I can just uh, tell you a couple of things. State vector, the state vector of our satellite, 
what we're going to call state vector from now on, and we actually have done it already, at least in MATLAB, is the position and the velocity of our satellite in this in this coordinate system. So it's R and V, right? In coordinates uh, that are Cartesian. So we call state vector x i plus y j plus z k and velocity x dot y plus y dot j plus z dot k. Now this is very impractical. I mean you can do it in MATLAB, you can integrate these equations, everything that we've done so far. But people use a different type of uh, coordinates called orbital parameters to represent what a spacecraft is in ECI. Because our planet is a sphere, and so trying to use something that has to do with angles is probably a good idea. So next time we'll introduce uh, orbital parameters that are based. There are six of them. Of course I need, if I want an alternative to this, I still need six, right? I have here x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot. This, this is telling me the state of my spacecraft, where it is and how fast it's going as a vector, right? So if I want to switch to something else, I still need six. But there are more convenient ways than using Cartesian coordinates um, called orbital elements where three of those are a specific sequence of order angles. How many know what order angles are and have seen order angles before? You probably have in other classes. Dynamics, you should have. Uh, but we'll, we'll use them. Uh, it's a 3-1-3 three, sequence. Uh, so we'll start introducing inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, um, uh, argument of perigee, and then some of the things that we have seen will still apply, semi-major axis, eccentricity, and true anomaly. But uh, these are the things that allow us to be in, in 3D, and the orbital elements will start doing them, and uh, we use them for the rest of the semester because they're very, very convenient. Any questions about this? This is just introducing the framework for what we'll do. So now ECI is a very specific coordinate system, right? If you want to think about what is the reference frame associated with this coordinate system, what would that be? Remember, reference frame is at least three points, right? I never talked about three points, I just gave you the coordinate system, but that's fine. One is the center of the planet, one is this far away constellation, the Fitch constellation, so you can treat that as a point. And then here is the North Star, whatever that is. So those are the three points, if you want. And we are moving. The center is moving. But the, the, these, these objects here are so far away that, again, in a short time period, we don't see them changing at all. Now, if you wait 10,000 years, this is going to move very slowly, but it does move. And that as well. Make sense? Because this axis is not staying the same in inertial space. OK. I think I brainwashed you enough. We'll see you on Friday.